um, begin. Uh, good afternoon or good day. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Alex Schwartz. I am the Deputy Director of the Centre for Comparative and Public Law at HKU Faculty of Law. I am joined today by Dr. Sylvia Chiteau uh, from University College London, uh, who will be talking to us about her fantastic new book, uh, Eternity, Clauses in Democratic Constitutionalism, published this year, just recently, by Oxford University Press. So let me say a, a few words about our guest today. Uh, Dr. Shutu is lecturer in public law at uh, University College London. Her PhD is from the University of Edinburgh. She has published widely on a number of topics in comparative constitutional law. So many of you will be familiar with her work. Let me say a few words of introduction about the book itself. Um, so I have to say that I, I really did love this book. Uh, I read it practically in a single sitting, in one sitting, uh, which I can't say is always the case for books in uh, our field, but I was, I was very much gripped by it. Uh, I found it very engaging. Uh, what's great about it is, first of all, it's written in very, very, very lucid prose. Uh, it's full of a diverse array of concrete examples from more than just sort of the typical well-trodden jurisdictions that are that are uh, referred to in comparative constitutional law. And substantively, I think the book does a number of admirable things uh, really well. So uh, first of all, it's a powerful challenge to a number of, you might say, emergent conventional wisdoms in the field on the topic of constitutional unamendability. It is a kind of warning of sorts about the dark side of constitutional unamendability. It cautions us against jumping to easy conclusions that unamendability is a force for good. Uh, the book points out a number of ways in which it might be exploited for various uh, nefarious purposes. Um, and it is often, as the book makes the case, uh, deeply contest contested, externally conditioned, uh, it can be used to hinder legitimate constitutional changes. It probably doesn't do much to prevent democratic backsliding and so on. So there's a number of challenging arguments there uh, to this, as I called it, an emergent conventional wisdom about the desirability of constitutional unamendability. Along the way, uh, the book includes, I think, a very succinct and effective takedown of the concept of constitutional identity. Um, the book also draws attention to post-conflict constitutions often ignored by comparative constitutional law scholars uh, and shows the pragmatic, profoundly political, radically bargained nature of eternity clauses in those contexts. Um, so we will have a chance to uh, engage in some discussion, some questions and answers with the author after uh, Dr. Shuto uh, explains the key arguments of the book. Um, so I will, uh, I will, pass the uh, virtual mic, so to speak, over to Dr. Chitto to talk to us about this great new book. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, both for the introduction and for that uh, <laughs> really uh, thorough account of, of the book. I am delighted to have a chance to discuss it with you, the center and, and the attendees today. Um, what I thought I would do is say a little bit about the genesis and evolution of the project um, behind, behind the book and then reiterate some of uh, the conclusions and what I think is a distinctive approach in the book and what, as you have uh, so neatly um, explained, has become almost an established um, understanding of, of unamendability. So yes, the project did begin as a, as a PhD in the University of Edinburgh uh, many years ago, I won't say how many, uh, but has evolved significantly since. Now, back when I began uh, working on this, there actually hadn't yet been as much scholarship on unamendability, whether in their uh, formal sense of eternity clauses entrenched in constitutions or on uh, judicially crafted doctrines. Much of what existed was written about Germany, the sort of prototypical formal eternity clause case, or on India, beginning with the Keshavananda case, of course, and um, all the subsequent basic structure doctrine cases. And we all know there has been exponential growth in the field 
since with people like Henry Crosnay, Richard Albert, Rosalind Dixon, many others, uh, having written and contributed and mapped really the terrain um, concerning unimaginability. But what was beginning to, to emerge in my research was um, the notion of a particular view taken of unamendability and really more generally of constitutional entrenchment. And I'll say a few, a few of the features that were seemingly shared across authors. So one was that unamendability was about constitutional fundamentals. Um, and those fundamentals would be sort of general constitutionalism uh, requirements or structures, values and principles, or fundamentals about the identity of the polity itself. So when it comes to values and principles, you can think enshrining democracy or a particular understanding of democracy, enshrining the principle of federalism, perhaps the principle of secularism, but equally um, unofficial religion, unofficial language, uh, etc. So there's an idea of fundamental, of essential there. Um, examples of structures of constitutionalism being enshrined, think judicial independence, think access to courts, constitutional review or judicial review itself. Another feature I think that was beginning to emerge was um, this view of unamendability as a measure of last resort. And in a sense, this was the, the initial logic behind unamendability, certainly in, um, in Germany. So the logic of militant democracy, that democracies need to have the means to defend themselves, um, that you need to be able to prevent um, the undermining of the whole constitutional order through um, otherwise legitimate or procedurally legitimate constitutional amendment. And that in instances where substantively a constitutional amendment uh, seeks to dismember or um, undermine the constitutional edifice, courts need to be able to intervene and uh, protect that edifice through resorting to unamendability. Again, whether rooted in a formal return to clause or themselves developing uh, a judicial doctrine, such as the basic structure doctrine or a minimum core doctrine to say, no, this is actually beyond the bounds of the constitution as, as we know it. Um, there are other um, conventional, as, uh, as Alex put it, understandings of um, unamendability that were emerging. For instance, looking at paternity clauses in particular as, as an ordering mechanism, as the mechanism and foundation through which to uh, reinforce a certain constitutional hierarchy, with the idea being that not all values, principles, provisions of a constitution are created equal, that there is an internal hierarchy that needs to be preserved, and that at the top of that hierarchy would be whatever the content of a formal maternity clause would have you, um, would have you see as, uh, as fundamental. So within this view, the only alternative to constitutional unamendability would be constitutional revolution, would be a new process of constitution making. And really, insofar as there was a more critical take on unamendability, um, the only tension that seemed to be recognized was the age old tension um, concerning judicial review on the one hand, democracy on the other. So sort of the old key, the old critiques of judicial and constitutional review were being rehashed when it came to entrenchment and in particular unamendability. Now, reacting to all of that, it seemed to me as though all of that um, you know, set of conclusions was actually dependent on a particular view of um, unamendability, certainly an amendment, but also of, of courts and constitutional review. And I sought out to um, look at non-traditional jurisdictions um, with a view to present a more complex picture of what was happening here. And the reason for looking at jurisdictions such as, um, you know, democratizing societies, deeply divided societies, post-conflict, post-authoritarian um, constitutions was because actually if you look at where, you know, the world's uh, eternity clauses and unamendable doctrines are present, the vast majority is within these types of jurisdictions. Uh, your Germany is the exceptions in a way. It is actually newer democracies that are paradoxically most in need of unamendability to enshrine certain um, commitments and 
um, and achievements in the constitution and as I say in the book also where unamendability is perhaps most dangerous and to to add to all of this what the book also does is it considers the prospects of unamendability in context of what we now refer to as democratic backsliding so as a bulwark against um, previously seen as consolidated democracies potentially undermining their constitutional protections through uh, constitutional amendment so i move then uh, into explaining a little bit about what makes the approach in the book distinctive i believe and that is that unamendability is, as I said, uniquely appealing, but also potentially uniquely dangerous in exactly the context in which it is most needed. Why is it uniquely appealing? Well, um, take one example of term limits, widely found in constitutions across Latin America and Africa in direct response to the experience of these constitutional orders with executive overstay. It is the bluntness of saying a term limit of one or two terms is unamendable that seemingly makes it so effective. It's not just that um, you, know, you see the rule being broken what it is, but you potentially have the stigma of unconstitutionality to be able to attach to it. And even if it might not stop that executive overstay, it at least signals internally and externally that this is not a constitutionally democratically legitimate. Um, you know, the same power that is occurring. Think also of wide ranging unamendable human rights commitments that are often found in unamendable provisions as well as it uh, recognized as part of uh, judicial doctrines of unamendability. So typically you would have either certain um, rights commitments themselves or you would have a rights uh, non-retrogression clause being uh, recognized as unamendable. So the idea that there is, uh, the, you know, there is a, a minimum threshold of rights protection that is recognized by the constitution and whatever amendment comes thereafter should not decrease uh, the level of rights protection or one variant would say, uh, you shouldn't do away with the essence, um, so shouldn't suppress or eliminate certain rights. So you see the appeal of that in particular in post-conflict contexts where it is exactly the sort of human rights um, protection structures that are enshrined in the constitution that are taken also as guarantees of, uh, of the post-conflict settlement. And where, uh, as Alex pointed out, you know, the constitution was so radically bargained for and such a hard fought pact that having unamendable um, commitments such as the commitments to, to human rights and human rights non-retrogression is uniquely appealing. And the third example I'll give here is um, more to do with basic, stru basic structure or minimum core doctrines, which uh, by definition have a more structural scope, right? So um, India uh, developed its basic structure doctrine, as we know, it, it didn't sort of limit it to an exhaustive list of of values and principles, it built um, that list through subsequent case law, it expanded on it and developed it and explained it without ever sort of closing the door on what would be recognized as part of the basic structure doctrine. And part of what makes that appealing is the fact that it presumably has potential to capture more structural amendments that would undermine the constitution and democratic commitments in the constitution in a way that would be difficult to pinpoint as you know sort of undermining just the one provision if you say well there's a whole package of constitutional amendments that overall undermine executive accountability um judicial independence um you know legislative autonomy etc then that it, that becomes appealing, especially today when we've seen across the world so many instances where democratic backsliding is achieved not through the one amendment that that is obviously sort of anti-democratic, but through a series of incremental um, attacks on the institutions and, uh, and principles of democratic constitutionalism. One recent example that has been um, sort of discussed uh, and. Uh, uncovered in 
in the literature and on comparative constitutional law would come from Kenya. So some of you might be aware of the recent BBI judgment from the Court of Appeal before that, the High Court in, in Kenya, where um, the president had initiated a massive constitutional uh, amendment package that really expanded executive power, undermined the parliament, undermined accountability, and would have been very difficult to capture um, and to sanction through anything other than the structural type of judicially crafted basic structure doctrine that uh, the Kenyan courts eventually developed. Now, why do I say in these contexts then that unamendability is also uniquely dangerous? And why is my book in a sense um, an invitation to reckon with the dark side of unamendability for well, several reasons. And I'll, I'll give three and we can discuss others in, in Q&A as well. One is um, that contrary to this initial assumption uh, about unamendability being the constitutional fundamentals um, sort of agreed upon, non-controversial, they are actually not always about uh, enshrining liberal constitutional ideals but may and often do insulate exclusionary and even majoritarian values and principles. Now in the book, I discuss examples from uh, my home jurisdiction of, of Romania, uh, from Israel, in other work I discuss, for instance, Thailand. Um, the argument here is not that you might have undemocratic constitutions that have uh, unamendable provisions, which would be you know, hardly surprising, but it is that even in constitutions otherwise seen as democratic, liberal, accepted as such, you have, um, you can have these types of exclusionary majoritarian values being enshrined in a formal alternative clause or being recognized and developed as unamendable by courts, while at the same time pur purportedly retaining that liberal constitutional ethos. In the case of Romania, you would have the definition of the state as national. Seemingly innocuous, in practice, what that has meant has been blocking any attempt at reform that would in any way, even indirectly, uh, be seen as um, challenging the, the single nation nature of, of the state. Um, and uh, you know, we're not talking sort of secession here. We're talking, for instance, administrative reorganization of the territory, which is so far as the constitutional court could see it as in any direct or indirect way linked to ethnicity and ethnic reorganization being blocked and blocking a whole package of amendments on account of the eternity clause um, enshrining the state and the territory is invisible and the state as, as national. Another uh, example of potential dangers of unamendability, this assumption that they are, that eternity clauses, or basic structure doctrines are re resorted to as, um, you know, a last instance type of, of defense. It doesn't quite hold when we look in comparative perspective. Many of you might be familiar with um, uh, well, is it still recent? A uh, 2016 judgment from the Indian uh, Supreme Court where attempts to reform the judicial appointments process were blocked by the Supreme Court on account of it undermining judicial independence, judicial independence having been recognized as a core element of the basic structure doctrine, a no go. Of course, when you actually look at what the attempt at reform was trying to do, it, first of all, wasn't a unheard of uh, model of judicial appointments, which involved some political involvement. Um, it was really an attempt to safeguard judicial supremacy within the judicial appointments process. And it actually blocked what effectively amounted to a return to a type of system that had existed in India before uh, reforms have changed it, enshrining judicial supremacy. So that is an example of uh, what I call sort of judicial turf protecting by resorting to the logic and language of unamendability. We can um, consider other uh, examples as well. 
Colombia has um, also is also sort of a, a popular example when it comes to judicially created doctrines. The Colombian Constitutional Court has created a constitutional replacement doctrine that was seen very favorably also in, in the literature and collective um, scholarship because it seemed again to be able to capture these types of structural um, attempts to undermine the constitution. However, it too used that constitutional replacement doctrine to block otherwise potentially acceptable um, reforms of the judicial appointments process. And if we look at polities that in the meantime would not even uh, be considered democratic anymore, I believe like Turkey, there as well, you see uh, the constitutional court, even before the current authoritarian slide, uh, relying on the formal eternity clause in the constitution, um, really to enshrine a particular notion of the nation, of the nation, of to protect the official language, to block attempts uh, at recognition of the Kurdish minority, of their language, um, educate, education in their own language, and, and really sort of um, to preserve that, again, a unitary, specifically Turkish notion of, of the nation. And final uh, reason to be worried about unamendability is that it's really very difficult, if not impossible, to do away with. So once you have unamendability, whether formally in your constitution or judicially created through the courts, it seems as though it is a creature that keeps on keeps on growing. It never really, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And attempts to do so risk themselves actually being captured under uh, the label of, um, of illegitimacy because they undermine the purported fundamentals of um, itself. Now in the book, I also discuss other developments to try and show just the growth and spread of unamendability and constitutional identity, which is uh, logically linked to it, I discussed the rise of constitutional identity review in, in Europe, which I'm happy to say more about if there is interest, but also the uniquely transnational nature of unamendability. The fact that we are seeing um, unamendability spread also through um, transnational constitution making, so constitution making processes that are influenced by transnational actors, by international experts that sort of uh, you know, perpetuate the idea that unamendability is a safeguard to be um, adopted, in, especially in post-conflict, uh, post-authoritarian constitutions, uh, several uh, examples from formerly known as Arab Spring constitutions would be, uh, would be relevant here, but elsewhere as well. And also the interesting rise of a uh, constitutional amendment reviewed by supranational courts. So the idea being that um, where national courts themselves can't or won't intervene to block unless uh, problematic amendments, you might have the measure of last resort be dislodged to the supranational level. And I discuss examples from the European Court of Human Rights in particular. So really the book, and I'll stop here, is an attempt to, to recenter the democratic critique of unamendability and to, to invite us all to take it more seriously. It is not uh, to say that eternity clauses and unamendable doctrines will always work in this nefarious way, but it is to say, we really need to be aware that this does happen. And as I said, that it is more likely to happen exactly in the jurisdictions and within the constitutional systems where unamendability would be most needed. I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion. Uh, that's that's brilliant, uh, Sylvia. Because I that's a great note to end on. Because I I one of the questions I wanted to ask you kind of follows from precisely the the, the point that you that you just concluded with. So before I get into my questions for you, though, I just want to uh, invite the uh, attendees of this event. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Shito, to write them into the um, the Q and A function. Uh, through Zoom, and I will I will uh, then uh, then pose them to our to our guest author here today. So let me let me move on to my question then. So I think that um, people who are committed to a normative project of constitutional theory may bristle uh, 
uh, <laughs> at, at this book. Because one, in, one way to read it or to read between the lines, I don't think you ever actually say this explicitly, but let me just push it to a kind of more perhaps exaggerated version of, of, of something which is I think present in the book, which would be that, look, you can't really have a general normative theory of constitutional unamendability. If you, if you pose the question, is it good or bad to, to uh, have an eternity clause, the answer is always, well, it depends. It depends on the context. It depends on the, the, the risks that are, that are present in a particular time and place, the, the pros and cons that arise in a very contextual way. So it's sort of futile to even engage in that more general normative project. So people who are committed to that, I think might find this distressing because uh, you, are, you are perhaps suggesting that they're, they're engaged in a, in a fool's errand. Um, so I wonder what you might have to say about that. I have a kind of follow-up question to that question, but I'll let you sort of respond to that. Thank you, Alex. That's a great question because it also allows me to put my cards on the table and say how I view constitutional theory itself. Now, it's, it's interesting because I, I see myself as engaged in both constitutional theory and comparative constitutional law, but not as separate approaches to these questions, but actually trying to merge them uh, into a single endeavor. And I think I'll start answering your question by saying that my own view of constitutional theory is that you cannot be a good constitutional theorist without comparative awareness and also without um, awareness of the constitutional politics behind all these concepts that we're, we're discussing. Um, otherwise, you know, you're sort of inching towards jurisprudence and, and, not, and legal philosophy. A good constitutional theorist to me is one who is aware that the way these institutions and doctrines and, and values and principles operate across systems will be very different depending on uh, on the conditions on the ground. So those to me are not sort of add-ons or afterthoughts. If your theory doesn't work in a substantive proportion of the cases out there, then the theory needs revising. It's not that, um, you know, all these constitution makers got it wrong or all these constitutional courts just did it wrong. It didn't follow particular normative theory that, that you espouse. So yes, it is, um, you know, it's an applied project, this book, um, of, of this view of, of constitutional theory. I'm still sort of trying to articulate it in, in many ways, including what I mean by a sort of comparative constitutional theory. But I think it's, it's the only way that we can really, in 2021, sort of issue, now I bristle at saying normative pronouncements because I don't typically, <laughs> you know, like to, to issue them. But insofar as you want to be able to say, let's say to a constitution maker or to a constitutional judge, well, you should do this or that, then you can't say that just based on uh, you know, a limited number of, of cases and a sort of limited understanding of um, the conditions within which unamendability will operate. And this is why in the book as well, I try to implicitly, you're right, make the point that while often ignored, these jurisdictions are actually not peripheral for our understanding of um, of unamendability in this instance, but constitutional design more generally, really. They are just as revealing and just as informative and just as illustrative of the problems and, uh, and potential of constitutional mechanisms as your Germany. Uh, thank you very much. It kind of it kind of answers my, my follow-up question, which was which was um, how this brings constitutional theory closer to the sort of field, I guess you call it a field of uh, constitutional design for divided societies. So people, often political scientists working in that area are very comfortable with the messy, contingent, contextual uh, turf that they're working in. And so, you know, the institutional prescriptions to the extent that people have them and they, there are, you know, sort of there are, there are camps within that field that have sort of favorite institutional fixes, but they are often very much uh, thought of as being very responsive to, uh, to particular contextual problems and not, not sort of general generic prescriptions for all societies. No one would say everyone should have consociationalism, for example. No, you would say, look, if your society has X, Y, and Z, maybe you should think about some version of consociational power sharing 
nobody is nobody is offering that as a general model for constitutional democracy. So um, anyway, great. I will. I will. Uh, I will. Can I say something here? Because yeah. it, it, it's a really interesting uh, point, and it's part of why I'm so drawn to the literature on divided societies, uh, of course, not just because there are so many of them, we need to understand them. But I think it's that complexity and that reluctance to, um, to view constitutional design in black and white terms that, that is so valuable that we can draw on from, from the literature on constitutional design for divided societies and it, to give you just you know maybe one example to apply to to unamendability think of the notion of institutional capacity and i think especially sort of the nature of courts and and courts capacity to do the work that unamendability actually requires them to do in order to to be effective right you don't want to have an eternity clause that is there as window dressing or um, sort of just a symbolic commitment that doesn't really mean anything in practice. So when you have that type of provision, implicit is also uh, having a court that is, first of all, operational. If we look at uh, Tunisia, you know, celebrated constitution until it was suspended recently. Um, but many years after having been adopted, a constitutional court that was meant to operationalize that constitution, including the eternity clause in the constitution, still not set up for various reasons. Um, think also of the capacity of courts in these uh, types of systems to be able to actually say no to power, to, to sanction that executive overstay without risking being dismantled or packed or captured in, in other ways. It is those types of considerations that we also need to, to you know, square with when we say, for instance, to a constitutional designer, well, you should have, uh, you know, a term limit and render it unamendable in, in your constitution. And final example I'll give here about legal culture and um, and a type of courts that, that we're talking about. I think often there is um, an assumption in the literature, which is also linked to the jurisdictions that have dominated the literature on constitutional review, an assumption of a particular type of court, particularly um, sort of, you know, the courts that, that reason in a particular way, that write their judgments in a particular way, that justify their judgments in a particular way. And that is just not the reality for many of the systems out there. They're not um, this kind of reason giving uh, bodies that enjoy through that reason giving um, also a certain kind of uh, legitimacy within the system. Often they will be very sort of formalistic, um, institutions that might not have, because of that, the capacity to, to engage in the kind of um, debates on you know, the nature of democracy and why a particular amendment might undermine it that we would ideally like to see because, of course, all these unamendable fundamentals are actually deeply contested uh, and have to do with deeply contested concepts. So just to say, I agree with, with all of that and just wanted to give a few examples for, for why, you know, I would, I would never go out and, and sort of say, you know, you need to have an amendability and you have to, it really does depend. Thank you, thank you very much, Sylvia. I will, uh, I will start fielding some questions from, from the attendees. Uh, our director of the center, uh, Professor Yap, has a question for you. Sylvia, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you for the really lucid explanation and defense of your book. Uh, uh, I'll just have one question. And I think you're very right in pointing out that, you know, we have to be a little more circumspect about judges enforcing this implied basic structure doctrine. After all, you would possibly be entrenching, you know, what a couple of men decide against change for a long time. Right, but at the same time, I'd like to raise uh, some counter arguments. What if the constitution itself was created against, and it was in, or the amendment there was an amendment passed actually to introduce such basic structure doctrine into the constitution, and the intention of the framers was it for it to be judicially enforced? And I think an example I'll give is Bangladesh. Right. The 15th Amendment was passed by the framers intentionally to entrench substantive limits against change. 
because of the years whereby the past governments have imposed martial law. So how should judges then deal with all these uh, uh, clauses whereby there are explicit texts endorsing, I mean, whereby, whereby certain changes are simply prohibited. And in that case, should judges instead operationalize all these uh, doctrine, not so much by identify what may or may not be amended, but by adopting a different standard of review, right? So they could apply Thayer and, Thayer and review, like menace, only strike down amendments that are Wednesbury unreasonable, or two, they may want to take into account, and this will be extra legal, how easy, how easily can they be amended? I mean, sorry, how easily can the judges be reversed? So certain constitutions can only be amended with a referendum, right? Or and certain amendments can only occur with a referendum. And perhaps for such sticky constitutions, judges might want to exercise more restraint whereby constitutions or provisions can be simply overturned by a dominant party who happens to be temporarily in office, then maybe judges may have more you know, legitimacy in foreclosing you know, abusive change. Do you want me to, to answer that, Alex, or collect questions? Oh, sorry, Sylvia. Yes, please go right ahead. Yeah. OK. Uh, many, many different ideas there to, to respond to. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yap, for, uh, for that. And of course, I've learned so much from your own work on, on the topic. That's great to finally have the chance to have a dialogue on it. I think I'll start with where you ended, which is that context does matter. And I think, um, you know, thinking through how to, how to make sure that it matters also in the, uh, in the way courts operationalize these, these doctrines is, is important. Am I saying that judges should never touch on amendability and never you know, sort of pretend it's, it's not there in their arsenal? No, I'm not saying that. And I think that would be completely unrealistic to say. In some instances, you do have a formal eternity clause with explicit or often implicit uh, constitutional review powers for the court to step in and actually give effect to it. Um, so you know, there's the general critique of unamendability that I offer in, in the book, of course, you know, helping us understand when it should or shouldn't be uh, resorted to. But then there's also the realistic view that these types of clauses and doctrines do exist on the books and that there needs to be um, awareness of when they might be applied uh, in a way that doesn't, doesn't help. So context does matter. And the example of Bangladesh is a really interesting one. It's not, uh, we, you know, we wouldn't look at this example the same had the basic structure doctrine not been developed explicitly in response to a, a long period of, of martial law and trying to undo um, damage to the constitutional edifice through constitutional amendment as part of that, that period. So I think that that matters to begin with. Um, does it matter how easy the constitution is to, to amend when courts intervene to, um, to the effect of the basic structure doctrine? Um, I think it does. If you look at the, um, you know, the arguments by someone like uh, Yannick Drosnai, he actually sort of goes further and, um, and sort of tries to come up with a standard of review saying, you know, the, the more participatory um, the constitutional amendment process is, the more restraint the courts should show because that means the, the amendment process comes ever closer to approximating um, a new constitution making moment, right? And that in those instances, courts should be um, sort of deferential to the views of the people. Now, I think that is, that sounds really good, but then again, when you look at how constitutional amendment processes actually operate in many systems, including, and especially those with participatory elements, um, it's often exactly there where you would like the court to be a bit more circumspect rather than less circumspect, because as we know, participation, public participation in constitutional reform is often manipulated, abused, and can be used itself for nefarious purposes. And as a sort of as a um, you know as a legitimating veneer by often the executive or 
the factories and, and the quality. So I would say um, that that works as long as the process is genuinely participatory and you're not actually dealing with uh, an instance where that amendment process is um, legitimated through this veneer of, of participation and then the courts exercising restraint would actually further um, embolden the undermining of, um, of the constitution through a veneer of participation. Now, in, I don't actually go into uh, discussing standards of review for courts in the book itself because it is meant to be more a sort of a democratic uh, critique of a fundamental ability theory and, and how it's come to, to spread. But what I do do in a, in a chapter is discuss this tension between um, the rise of public participation in constitution making worldwide and us seeing it as a good thing and the simultaneous rise and expansion of uh, implied doctrines of unamendability and formal eternity clauses and ask, okay, how do we square these? Are these just two completely different uh, separate developments that we just haven't really thought of together uh, at the same time? Or, you know, can we think of a way to bridge them? And I say, look, if, uh, for example, you have a constitution making moment that is genuinely participatory, but that also results in, um, let's say, a formal eternity clause being enshrined in the constitution. You might argue that the Tunisian example in 2014 is one such example, so far as the process was certainly more participatory than anything that had happened in uh, the MENA region up until that point. And there is at least more legitimacy behind interpreting that formal eternity clause as one that is about fundamentals um, recognized as such by the polity. So that would be say, a court recognizing that would be the court recognizing the validity of uh, the participatory constitution making process itself, not just, and using that, importing that into its interpretation of, uh, of the eternity clause, rather than simply assuming that it is, which has often happened um, in systems where, you know, the constitutions were the result of purely elite pacts no participation whatsoever, but then the claim of we the people have rendered this unamendable being taken, taken for. I think I've talked for too long, so I'll stop and give a chance for more questions. Thank you, Sylvia. I, I have a few questions here from our uh, attendees. Um, I will take one of them actually relates, it's very much connected to what we were just, what you were just speaking about. So, in a context where you do have um, a, a, a good process of uh, constitutional enactment of an eternity clause, do you think that that kind of cuts off courts from developing? Um, are, you know, so, so does that sort of foreclose the possibility then of the courts developing uh, their own sort of basic features, minimum core doctrines and constitutional adjudication alongside that, right? So where you've got this clear, let's assume, right? It's, good, it's a good statement of the, the, the we the people acting together, how, whatever that means. Um, and, uh, and so we've got, we've got ourselves a nice looking eternity clause uh, in, in a, you know, which has been uh, arrived at in as legitimate a, a way as we can imagine. Um, so should the courts just back off then and from, from elaborating any further uh, minimum core, basic, basic structure type stuff? Very interesting question. So it's to rephrase it once more, it's, it's almost asking us, uh, asking whether an eternity clause is exhaustive of unamendability, right? Once you have it on the books, is that all there is? I think in practice, the answer would be no, if you look comparatively, it has happened and does happen that you have systems with formal eternity clauses uh, where the courts have also developed implied unamendability doctrines, I think Italy would be one. And the reason for that is how, you know, it's the content of formal eternity clauses. In many systems, you don't actually have this kind of this isn't the, the role of the formal eternity clause. It's often sort of a declaratory. Um, statement of these essentials of, uh, of the constitutional system. Often you only have just a you know, one sentence declaration of the republican nature of the state, well, so, which is the case of Italy, France, other, uh, other polities. So to limit um, 
the notion of constitutional fundamentals to that would be incorrect, I think. Now, whether those constitutional fundamentals then should be developed as part of a implied doctrine of unamendability is a separate question. But just this particular question, whether the formal alternative clause is exhaustive of, of, of constitutional essentials, I think it's it's not. And there is an you know, the, there are potential errors of, and unintended consequence, consequences that, that can flow from that. You see it a lot in um, the constitutional identity review doctrine that has been developed by multiple apex courts in, in Europe, where um, what has happened is they've sought um, constitutional tools to put a break on, on European integration, or to react to various elements of European integration. The German Constitutional Court is the most famous, but you know, there are others as well, the Czech Court, Italian Court, and others, where what they want to be saying is, you know, there are limits determined by the national constitutional um, evidence to European integration. And as part of those limits, they look to the formal eternity clause. And I think, um, you know, there are pros and cons to that, the cons being that often, again, the turn to clauses were not actually drafted with a view to serve as that break on European integration, quite on the contrary sometimes. Um, but also just if you look, if you unpack the um, constitution making process and the, and the, you know, the thinking of the framers, if you will, uh, behind that constitutional design, the different uh, expectations of what the formal clause is meant to do. Sometimes it really was, especially for older constitutions, meant to be there as a kind of a symbolic declaratory statement without any thought given to it actually being operationalized through constitutional review. And it is only later, sometimes decades later, that the courts also recognize for their own self, self the power um, to, to say they actually have the power to, um, you know, to review amendments uh, substantively. So, I mean, I think I answered uh, the question, but I did want to separate those elements of the question, you know, the question of um, the formal eternity clause be separate from constitutional fundamentals, and then also a separate question of whether we should develop those constitutional fundamentals into uh, an unimmutability doctrine. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. A couple other questions here I will, I will bundle together. Um, so, one of one of our one of our attendees pointing out that um, you know maybe it would be or suggesting you know maybe it would be better uh, it would be a more favorable context for eternity clauses in sort of quote unquote consolidated long established consolidated constitutional democracies uh, that they would be introduced once the constitutional system let's say has reached a certain state of maturity um, maybe a late introduction of eternity clauses might be valuable. Uh, the, same, the same person asks a question, which is an interesting little, almost like a Zen cone. Um, can eternity clauses exist in uncodified constitutions, such as the UK and New Zealand? So I actually think there's a lot, there's actually, that's a, that's a, that's a deceptively simple question. Uh, and I think that there might be a lot in there that you, that you might want to respond to. Uh, the same person also suggests, well, um, what about just making things more difficult to change? Does this end up amounting to the same thing or maybe it's more desirable to have very onerous amendment uh, procedures that in practice say almost result in a kind of informal unamendability, but maybe that's better for some reason. So anyway, those are three thoughts uh, to, to, to play with there. Um, yeah, quite, quite far reaching, but thank you to whoever asked that, those questions. Very, uh, very good questions. So the, the first one on whether um, unamendable provisions and doctrines are better suited to consolidated democracies and, and uh, mature democracies is a very interesting one because if what we're saying is that these are the contexts in which they're more likely to work as intended, so to have the types of courts, um, you know, the kind of legitimacy and institutional capacity to operationalize them, but also um, the kind of political actors that would not immediately seek to undermine the constitutional architecture. If that's what we're saying, then that doesn't square with the reality that those are not usually the context in which you need unamendability uh, and, and in which indeed you see unamendability emerging. It is in contexts that are um, transition 
to democracy from authoritarianism, from conflict, etc. It is in uh, in context where even sort of the achievements um, of democratic transition are in, in flux and in question. We can hear, for instance, of, of Hungary, um, where the question of unamendability was for for a while on the table until it was um, used and. and returned in a completely different direction by, by a captured court. So that argument has the problem that um, it sort of doesn't square with constitutional reality. Why would you need such a, such a measure of last resort and such a potentially, um, you know, I won't say completely anti-democratic, but, but democratically problematic constitutional mechanism exactly in those constitutional systems that should have other means of uh, protecting themselves. I'll also say that it, we often find the opposite argument to say that um, actually unamendability might make sense in the early days of, of a transitional system where you need to preserve the achievements of that um, hard fought constitutional agreement, but that they should actually not be eternity clauses as such, but sunset clauses say, you know, take some things off the table, let them be entrenched up until the time comes when um, we can go back to certain openness to the, to the constitutional um, structures because we are confident that, that the system can, can handle it. On the question of um, uncodified constitutions and how uh, unamendability plays out in them, if at all, I think that's a that's a really interesting one, and I'm starting to get them to get this question every time I present a book. So I'm thinking that you know there is um, there is an appetite for discussing unamendability in the UK and uh, in other systems, but you know a, a more a more of an appetite for that than I had realized. I think interestingly, what you see in the developments, especially when it comes to common law constitutionalism in the UK, is something that de facto resembles unamendability in its implied doctrine form far more than uh, UK constitutionalists might, might realize, right? So the, the usual story told about uh, the UK constitution, of course, is that it's um, partly codified and, you know, it's radical flexibility and openness are part of the reason why it has worked so well for so long. And then you see uh, the recognition of constitutional statutes um, you see the UK Supreme Court intervening to uh, you know, hold the executive to account, but also to, um, to recognize certain uh, constitutional principles and fundamentals, not just parliamentary sovereignty, but parliamentary accountability, you know, in order to, to block uh, developments that I think until recently would have seen as absolutely part and parcel of executive can do and what, what is constitutional, constitutionally permissible within the system. So whether it's through uh, the constitutional statutes doctrine, whether it's through the recognition of the principle of legality as a, as a substantive break on uh, certain actions under the UK constitution, I think you see something that ends up resembling implied unamendability quite a lot, which is paradoxical for, again, a constitutional system that views itself as, um, as radically open. Um, open. Entrenchment short of eternity clauses, um, I'm much more in favor of this. Again, comparatively, if you, if you look across systems, often you find exactly this, um, you know, tiered amendments, um, different mechanisms and, and paths to amendment uh, for different parts of the constitution. And that makes a lot of sense. What also helps when you have that uh, as, a, as a choice of constitutional design is more clarity about framework intent about that constitutional hierarchy. So what is truly important in the constitution um, or what should require more public buy-in or buy-in from the different branches becomes clearer when, uh, when you set different thresholds for amending uh, different, different bits of, of the constitution. Of course, in practice, it can uh, result in, in de facto unamendability, perhaps the US example is, is one such, uh, such example, right? Or even Canada, where, you know, on paper, the constitution is not 
unamendable, but in practice because of just the difficulties and the, the obstacles set in place, um, they become so over time. Uh, and even the perception of unamendability, I think, influences in turn whether people still think of constitutional amendment as a possibility, for instance, in the US, where it's as though they don't, even though I would, you know, some of the best bits of the US Constitution are. Uh, or amendments. So yes, more favor favorably disposed to uh, to entrenchment short of unamendability because at least in principle it leaves um, some constitutional openness on the table. But again, context matters when you look at how that is actually uh, going to play out in a particular system to determine whether it is or isn't um, unamendability snuck in through the back door. Thank, thank you, Sylvia. It occurred to me as you were talking about eternity clauses in the context or unamendability in the context of uncodified constitutions, that in the UK context, it's not just the common law constitutionalists that seem to kind of intimate uh, uh, that uh, possibility. I mean, really, you could read the old Dicean doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty as a principle of unamendability, right? Everything in the UK's constitution can be changed except for that one bedrock principle, which is unamendable. Um, any parliament that purports to change it can simply be overridden by the next one. So, so this, this is something enduring, eternal, that can't, you know, it's an, etern it's an eternal feature of the UK's constitution. So um, maybe, maybe, maybe the UK has always, or at least, at least since Dicey's day, let's say, uh, has long had a, a doctrine of unamendability. It's just that they didn't have the terminology uh, that we're now using to, to engage with um, all of these other contexts in, in the field of comparative constitutional law. Maybe this is a call for UK constitutional law scholars to get interested in other contexts and start talking to them about these, uh, these questions. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, wouldn't that be the, the paradox, right? Rather than, than my point, which is that the, the UK constitution might be uh, unintentionally inching towards unamendability, that it had actually been the original unamendable constitution out there. But all very interesting, of course. It's, um, there would be a lot to, to unpack also in terms of what that would mean in practice. And, and I think true that the, in general, and also here, that the that UK constitutionalists would stand to learn from comparative uh, experience. Also, if you look at the development of basic structured doctrines in, um, well, former colonies and, and systems that are also um, grounded, or at least were historically grounded on the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's there that we see um, you see the tensions emerge and you see the negotiations that have had to take place in order for those courts to inch towards recognizing a basic structure doctrine. I'm thinking of Malaysia, I'm thinking of Singapore, I'm thinking of uh, Sri Lanka, which is still rejecting this move precisely for, um, or at least justifying it on, on terms of, in terms of um, its adherence to parliamentary sovereignty and parliamentary supremacy, precluding anything like unamendability from being recognized by, by the court there. So taking that argument about the UK then uh, on a comparative roadshow, it would be interesting to say to these courts, let's say to the court in Sri Lanka, that, well, actually, unamendability and parliamentary sovereignty might not be as um, conceptually incompatible as, as you think they are. If you look at the UK itself, it, it is at least implicitly dealing with Thank you. I'm really looking forward to following your the trajectory of your work after this book because I think you still have so much to say about this topic. It's it's really uh, it's a, well it's it's a fascinating topic. It's attracted a lot of interest, but I think that you are one of the most important voices in this discussion. So. Um, I'm look, looking forward to, to, to hearing uh, and reading uh, about uh, the, the, the rest of this kind of research project, assuming you don't get bored of it and move on to something completely different. But I, I, it seems to me that there's still really a lot to be said about this. One last question, if, if, if you'll allow me, um, from one of our attendees, who just uh, raises the kind of the objection that they're, or the point sort of referring to Jeremy Bentham, who, who had said that, I'm paraphrasing here, a problem of unamendability is, is, is the idea of infallibility, which is, which is absurd. 
So um, what do you think about that? I mean, is it really just, is it kind of absurd? Is there a sort of ridiculous hubris kind of megalomaniacal confidence in, in any system that purports to uh, espouse an eternal truth? Should we just, <laughs> should we sort of look at this as kind of a kind of, a, a kind of madness? Well, <laughs> what a question to, to end on, right? I mean, if you're asking- You at UCL, if I may add. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I mean, if, <laughs> uh, am I even allowed to disagree with Bentham on those terms, right? Do I, let me-, let me Is there a um, term of your contract? <laughs> indeed, do, do I magically get disappeared if I disagree with the, the good old Bentham? Um, let me rephrase that and, and ask whether I think um, you know, constitutional infallibility in the form of unamendability makes sense, including enshrined as, as an eternity clause. I think um, the context really does matter. My own um, sense based on the research I've done so far is that on average, um, it won't make, uh, it, it won't be able to bring the benefits and to solve the problems that the designers hope it does. But in some, instances, it's not because you believe in the infallibility of the constitutional design as such that you have an eternity clause, for example. In some instances, it really is a much more pragmatic choice. We're going back to the post-conflict context and, and this context of radical compromise and impacting that gets enshrined in a constitution. In those instances, for example, you wouldn't have a constitution unless the parties could agree um, unless the parties could see a guarantee for that pact enshrined in an unamendable provision. So it's not really about the lofty ideal of, uh, of human infallibility. It's about much more mundane um, objectives, such as you know, getting the parties to actually agree to a constitution, getting that constitution to be passed, have it be on the books for a sufficient uh, period of time to actually allow for some democratic consolidation and then kind of re revisiting the issue and maybe uh, retiring the eternity clause or, or leaving it to the side. That might very well be the scenario that we're talking about. So in those instances, I think um, unamendability makes sense, but not for, for these lofty fallibility ideals for really just to, to get a constitution in the first place. Well, um, Dr. Chateau, uh, please allow me to uh, thank you on behalf of the uh, Center for Comparative and Public Law and on behalf of all the attendees. It was really a fascinating uh, discussion. We're very, very grateful to you for joining us today to talk about this great new book, uh, which I encourage everyone to run out and buy uh, in one way or the other. I think uh, Professor Yap has a physical copy of the book handy. Um, which, uh, which if you could, sh if maybe show it to our, yeah. to our audience here, that would be, um, I'll, I'll show it. I think his, uh, yeah, there ah, we go. That's the cover. There it, is. <laughs> there it is published with OUP this year in 2021. So, uh, thank you very much for your time today talking about this book. It was really uh, a pleasure for me to discuss this with you. And I, I think I speak, uh, for everyone here as well. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank, thank you, you very much. The, uh, and thank you to all of you out there whom I can't see, but uh, thank you for your questions and, uh, and your presence today. It was lovely and I quite enjoyed it. And may we meet in person again someday? Very soon, not Hope someday, soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye everybody.